and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 75, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. And me, Ravi Abbott. And this is the podcast for you. If you remember those heady days of running home from school, always straight to your friend's house, wasn't it? Still wearing your school uniform, everyone playing on like their Sega Master System. Yep, I remember that. Or being in the kind of arcades and, you know, running out of two P's for those machines. And then looking in the bottom of them and finding a few and then getting tons. What, those kind of penny drop things? Yeah, yeah. I I used to nudge them just, you know, ever so slightly so the alarm wouldn't go off. Oh, you you had the little skills, yeah. No, I think I have set an alarm off on one, actually. (laughs) Or maybe when you were at the seaside arcades, you remember playing classic games like, let's think of a few, Gallagher, obviously huge at the arcades back in the day. I remember playing Pac-Land, that was amazing. Or what about Defender? Oh, Defender, yeah, that was a a massive game, Uh, total game changer actually and we have on the show today eugene jarvis the arcade master the actual creator of defender robotron 2048 and smash tv narc as well narc as well yeah god he's so many titles now this guy i mean he is obviously we're going like to the earliest days of arcades here and you know he started in pinball which um kind of predated arcades you know. Yeah, a lot lot of people actually started in the kind of pinball industry and then went into it. But he was working for the pinball giants who were Williams, mm-hmm. you know, an Atari's pinball division. Yeah, I was like, what, really? Yeah, what's that? <laughs> and now he's actually got a studio called Raw Thrills where he's kind of bringing that retro experience back to the arcade as well. So, you know, we're going to be talking all about that. This week, I mean, you know, if you've got any interest in arcade gaming or just video games in general, Eugene Jarvis, what a legend. We've got him coming up as this week's special guest on the Retro Hour podcast in around 20 minutes from now. Now, obviously, before we get to our special guest on the show each week, there is lots of happenings in the world of retro, lots of stories we need to talk about. We're going to get to those in just a minute. But we want to say a massive thank you to you if you are one of the very, very generous people who help us keep this show going week in, week out. Because, you know, we will just remind you, we are a weekly podcast. Yeah, it's crazy kind of pumping these out every week. But, you know, the way we've got it is we've got it down to an hour and that kind of leaves us enough time to get all the complicated stuff done. But with your donations and stuff, you kind of really help out just stopping the stress and uh, helping us lead our life. Ravi spends hours looking for these guests every single week. And yeah, then Dan go- just turns up. <laughs> <laughs> Ten seconds before. What are we doing then? <laughs> Obviously, we've got you to edit the show as well. We've got to host a website, yep. SoundCloud. So, you know, all your donations just help us keep doing that week in, week out, guys. So if you enjoy the show and you're feeling generous, it is completely optional. We do have a little tip jar that you'll find at theretrohour.com. Uh, we take PayPal or uh, Bitcoin as well. Now, we want to say a massive thank you this week for your support to uh, Steve, our good friend Steve from Wavem Studios, who's a guy behind uh, the new Commodore Story movie who uh, very kindly donated to the show this week. And uh, Darren Coles. Michael Norgard. And Martin Williams. Who all made donations to keep the Retro Hour podcast running. Thank you so much from the bottom of our hearts, guys. It means the world to us. And of course, if you want to do the same, all you've got to do, it'll take you five seconds. Put your email address in, head to the website, theretrohour.com, click on that PayPal or Bitcoin link, and uh, your donation will come to us and keep the show going week in, week out. Now, I've been away on holiday for a week. We did record two weeks on the bounce before I went, and then, you know, had a little break, was in Italy, enjoying the sunshine, a few drinks. And I tried to have a bit of a digital detox and not, you know, do too much last week online. Yeah. But I did get a little alert on my phone. Someone saying, have you heard Atari are bringing out a new console? What, what, what? I knew they had the Atari <laughs> flashback. That was a, a kind of old school, like, you know, mini NES or something. But a new console? Yeah, that was like an at games, like, you know, third party thing, wasn't it, with their branding on? But yeah, I, I looked at that and I thought, what is my newsfeed being like, you know, delayed by 25 years or something? Yeah. The Jaguar too. <laughs> I thought, yeah, I thought someone must be having me on here. But then I got back and they've actually, have you got your web browser open on there? Yeah, yeah. Type in ataribox.com. Wait a sec. Got that URL, ataribox.com. There is a video there, really short. The entire thing is like 22 seconds. And it's got this like music playing in the background. Oh, yeah. And if you look at it. Ominous. It essentially looks like it's wood grain. It looks like the Atari 2600, but a little bit more shiny. Oh, yeah. LGR's going to go mad over this, isn't he? Wood grain. <laughs> wood grain on it, that kind of classic black, you know, sleek lines on there as well. The Atari logo. If you look very carefully, there appears to be some controller ports on there as well. Mm. But people have kind of been speculating as to, is this real? A lot of websites picked it up. You know, the next web.com, the Verge have been talking about it. They actually got in touch with the company that own the Atari license now, and they said, no, this is, you know... 
it's not like a mix take. This is a legit project. Yeah, it's what, not like your Dreamcast Two or anything like. This is an actual legitimate thing. Yeah, you mentioned then, you know, stuff like the um, the Atari flashback. Yeah. However, the next web dot com have been doing a little bit of a dig into this. Now they haven't released any more details about what this system is going to be, but there have been lots of people who've been doing speculation, trying to find out, you know, listening to the rumor mill and all that. They actually think this is not going to be like kind of a retro. Atari console in a box kind of thing. This is going to be a new system. <laughs> I'm confused. So, have Atari been releasing kind of games recently and software and stuff? They've 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 done a few titles, haven't they? Yeah. But they haven't got their kind of old IPs and franchises coming out. So this might be a, a kind of you know these retro remakes. It might be a, a new machine with lots of retro remakes on it. I don't know. It's interesting because if you look on this uh, very basic website they've set up, um, there is actually a kind of a job section there, and also they're hiring developers as well. So I'd imagine it's not just going to be a little emulation box, otherwise why do you need developers? Yeah, yeah, it could be, you know, an actual Atari system or something. This is really confusing. (laughs) Yeah, let's hope it's something interesting. Well, a lot of people are saying, you know, Atari are going to be back and they're going to compete with, like, you know, Microsoft and Sony. I don't see how. (laughs) Yeah. And then other people are saying, well, it looks like the 2600. You know, Woodgrain was cool in 1978, but you're going to see that on the shop shelf, you're going to be like, what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. the only way I could think of it is it's going to be an emulation box that you can, or, or like a PC, Xbox has a PC in it, essentially. One of those that kind of, you can emulate the old games, but then play new versions of the games on it. So I think they might be redoing some franchises or something, but yeah. That's really odd news. Where's it? Where's this come from, Dan? <laughs> yeah. like, well, it's the thing. It's like obviously it's not actual Atari. You know, it's like a company that owned their trademarks now because they went bust years ago. But again, it's what I'm thinking is. I mean, I've done a little bit of digging on this, and I think what it might be is a system kind of like the Ouya was. Ah, okay. So more like a platform where you have like a store and you can buy games off it. I imagine priced a lot cheaper than the PS4 and Xbox One, where you can get modern games and imagine all the Atari franchises will be there as well Mm. and probably updated versions of them that, you know, because a lot of kind of the HD remakes of these classic games do really well on like Xbox Arcade. Yeah, yeah. And the Mini NES has done fantastically well. So maybe they've had a little look at that and said, right, maybe we need to get back into hardware. Yeah. Well, it's like <laughs> the top comment on this article here that we'll link in our show notes. It says, brace yourself, VR Pong is coming. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that would be cool. <laughs> so if you want to find out more about that, you know, we'll put the little trailer in our show notes as well. And uh, we'll keep an eye on that story because, you know, when you get the original video games company, whatever this system is going to be, having a new console with the Atari branding on is just nuts. And, you know, you mentioned VR Pong. I remember a while ago in Nottingham, well, a while ago, it was 2006. (laughs) In 2006 in Nottingham, they had projected Pong in the Market Square, which is the city centre, so they projected from above Pong, and you could actually control the paddles, like, as humans, so there'd be drunk people running around <laughs> kind of like try- always is in the yeah. <laughs> <laughs> trying to control these giant paddles it's really good yeah i think every city should have one well, i remember you know on the atari jaguar obviously there was you know the um it never got released but the virtual reality headset they made for that mm-hmm. and the demo of that was playing missile command so these kind of classic arcade you know atari arcade experiences if you were to play them in vr that'd be amazing even kind of reminds me of tron yeah yeah so Maybe that'll be something they'll be looking at. You can do VR so cheap these days. True. Just use a phone or something. It's yeah, yeah, it in. Yeah. So we'll definitely keep an eye on that. If you want to check out that trailer, we'll put that in the show notes at theretrohour.com. Now, obviously, the Xbox One, they made a big deal last year at E3 that they, um, you know, even though they said it couldn't be done initially, they introduced Xbox 360 backward compatibility last year. And there are, you know, a few hundred games that you can play on the uh, Xbox One now. But in a surprise move, I don't think anyone saw this coming, Microsoft have now announced you're going to be able to play original Xbox games. Oh, that's on the cool. <laughs> yeah. that, that's really cool. Yeah, I guess I guess all they need to do is kind of put a different version of DirectX in there and then, you know, change a few of the codes. And it, It's probably not that hard to do, actually. Well, the Xbox 360 was a PowerPC processor, wasn't it? Oh, okay. But the so. ex- original Xbox was um, a Pentium 3, so that's obviously easier to emulate on an X86, yeah, isn't yeah. it? So you're not really doing any emulation, really, so it's a lot easier to do those games. Like you said, it's just DirectX, really, isn't it, I suppose? So. Yeah, and uh, that's pretty cool, because I think it's really important for game systems to have backwards compatibility. And 
it's kind of sad because, you know, some systems don't and it just cuts off all those previous titles. You know, you've got this big collection and it just goes kind of worthless. And I remember, what is it, the PlayStation, they always say, oh, yeah, it's backwards compatible. But not with all of the games. I've seen a few few mess-ups with uh, quite a few old PlayStation 1 games that I've tried on the uh, PS4. Actually, the, the PS3 was backwards compatible with the PS1, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Through software. And I know the they did put a PS2 on a chip, I think, or the actual PS2 chip You, you can do some on the PS4, though, can't you? You, a... you download them off the store. Ah, that's you probably the ones that in. I've played, yeah. Yeah, but actually, I mean, you mentioned that, and funnily enough, you know, after Microsoft's announcement, uh, Sean Layden, who is uh, Sony's boss of global games, kind of took the mickey out of them a little bit. He said that he was recently at a gaming show where they had... Uh, a Gran Turismo event it was where they had PlayStation 1, PS2, PS3 and PS4 games and he said he looked at the PS1 and PS2 games they looked ancient why on earth would anybody ever want to play this anymore? He completely dismissed <laughs> retro gaming. Wow, that's, that's stupid. Uh, I, I, I remember when the um, Dreamcast came out and there was that thing called Bleem where you, Bleem could, gas, yeah, yeah. you could basically have the um, PlayStation games and put them in a Dreamcast and use the extra power and actually... Sometimes the rendering would be nicer quality. And like I remember their version of Gran Turismo always had a, a little extra thing in the uh, Dreamcast version. Well, you'd only play them on emulators now. You know, yeah. like N64 games, you can play them in like 1080p. <laughs> well, like... Well, well, that was the kind of thing. And also, you know, Sega were just like, well, yeah, come on, emulate Sony, we don't care. We're, we're, we're dying. <laughs> so, you know. <laughs> well, kind of just rounding off this story, because this was another story that came out after it. Ars Technica actually have been doing this study. And, you know, a few thousand gamers they've been studying here for quite a lot of time. And it turns out, despite all Microsoft's efforts to, you know, do this backwards compatibility, less than 2% of Xbox One usage is for backwards compatible games. Wow. Okay, yeah. So <laughs> it's probably just cheaper to buy a bloody Xbox original, isn't it? And just load that up with the stuff. Yeah, they reckon the most played 360 game on it is Call of Duty Black Ops, which, you know, the most popular backwards compatible game. But they reckon apart from that, of the 1.65 billion minutes sampled, the average showed just 23.9 minutes of backwards compatible games. I remember, I always remember those Xbox originals were fantastic for emulation as well. So, yeah, I, I don't know if much of that happened with the 360, but I can't see it happening with the Xbox One. Too locked down these yeah. days. But you know what I think it is with backwards compatibility? I think it's either like, you know, people have still got, like, you know, if you want to play Xbox original games, you can get them so cheap now anyway. Mm. Or it's maybe one of those features where people think they want it, and then you get it, you just don't really use it. Well, that's, with me, it's... Uh, it's really personal because it's the controllers. And the thing is, yeah. I use a lot of the old controllers and I haven't used them for years. And my God, my hands hurt after like 10, 15 minutes of playing on it. But I've got an Xbox One controller, which is really nice. One of the most comfortable ones I've used. And I have all the emulators set up on the PC now. Finally done it. So I can sit there and kind of go through all the old games. And that's that's really good. And that's all... It's not backwards compatible, but it's it's kind of emulation, and I think that's the way to do it. Actually, you mentioned that, and I thought then, I'm kind of the total opposite to you then, in that case. Because if I play Halo 1 or 2, I want to use the Xbox Duke controller. Oh, God, that thing. It's yeah. like holding a baby, that one. It's, it's giant. But that's how, you know, that's how that game was designed in mind. Yeah, you know, if yeah. I play an Amiga game, I'll use a Zipstick. Yeah, I know what you mean. It's uh, Yeah, it's weird. I guess it's because I'm a sound engineer, and I'm play piano and stuff, so I'm probably going to got really bad off right or something <laughs> old man hands yeah that's it <laughs> but you know because i remember nintendo when they did super smash brothers on the wii u they bought that adapter out so you could use a gamecube yeah yeah pads so because that's how most people played the game back in the day so it's interesting i mean it is the fact that microsoft are putting so much effort into these like you know like nearly 20 year old games now some of them when less than two percent are using the last gen anyway it's like probably just a feature they can sell on i guess but it's nice to see the classic games getting some love and even if you know you imagine maybe some kids now who've never played these games before might see them cheap in a shop and be like, oh, you know. Yeah, because that kind of opened the world of online gaming to me, the original Xbox, and there were some really fantastic titles. I remember Full Spectrum Warrior was a really good, like, kind of Iraq-based one with all your commandos, and yeah, it was cool. <laughs> my housemate had one. I mean, I kind of, when the Xbox original came out, I kind of got out of gaming for a few years, but my housemate had one. He'd always play FIFA and stuff on it. And like, um, you know, in that, oh, the early days of Xbox Live, I remember you could, you could do voice changing on it as well. 
you can disguise your voice on the original Xbox oh, Live. Oh, cool. So <laughs> turn you into like a <laughs> robot, robot or yeah. make you into a female or something as well. So I'm not sure why they took that out, but you know, that was quite a cool feature. I just did voices. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just do them now, don't you? Yeah. Now, here's a franchise that hasn't been updated for quite a while. Do you remember Alex Kidd in Miracle World? I loved Alex Kidd. He was so cute. And uh, Alex Kidd was kind of... He's like really early Sega mascot, wasn't he? Well, I always remember it because my friend Dougie, he got um, a Master System 2. You know, the smaller one? Oh, and it's built in, wasn't it? Yeah. It's and like, I've got two games. And it's like, no, you know, that's built in. <laughs> that's all he had. Yeah. <laughs> he, got, he got it like second hand. His mum got it for Christmas. And I think the kid she bought it off, like he'd sell all his games. Ah. Just had the console. So my friend Dougie only had Alex Kidd in Miracle World for about six months. So we go around and play it like every weekend. So... I you know I haven't played that game for God about twenty five years. I could probably still play through that game. I reckon I might have to do a yeah. It, it was a pretty simple platformer actually, but it was good fun. Yeah, it's a free game as well. I mean, the thing is, it's never really been a franchise that Sega have revisited all that much. Really, um, you know, Miracle World was obviously such a legendary game, and because it was free, so many people played it back in the day. Yeah. Well, now there is actually a long-awaited Alex Kidd and Miracle World Two sequel. Oh. Wow, who's who's developed this then? Is this a, a fan game or is it a found game? Or? No, it's a fan-made ROM hack of the original. Oh, cool. So it uses like the same engine completely. It has like, you know, a lot of custom modifications in there as well. New set of designs, new graphics too. They've actually done a lot of work on this. It's not just like some guy replaced the graphics and, or a new title screen or something yeah. like that. This is actually a team of about six guys who've worked on this for two years now. Wow. And it's got, you know, the same engine it's based on as well, but it's got, you know, whole new levels in here too. They've written, like, a whole new story around this game too. It's got, like, um, new music. Alex Kidd's now got kind of long, funky hair in the oh, game. Oh, he's grown up a bit. They give him a new sprite, <laughs> new title screens, new map screens, new design as well. This was actually entered into a ROM hack competition about two years ago. Oh, cool. So you could download this and chuck it in, like, your EverDrive or on an emulator or something like this? Well, there is. It's on um, a website called smstributes.co.uk, which is all about the Master System. And uh, there is the ROM that you can download. I've, I've got a feeling it's not completely finished yet. I've heard it's about 80% of the way okay. there. But obviously it is workable, so you can download it, you know, even if you've got a Mega Drive with an EverDrive. That's oh. backward compatible, isn't it? Oh, sick. That's great. I, I know a few Alec Kid fans out there that would love this. <laughs> <laughs> well, they've even written a story about the game as well, you know. Do you remember back then, though? You'd always get stories that either pop up on the title screen. Yeah. Like, Try and press the A button to get past them. Yeah, <laughs> or you, yeah, or you get a book it. inside that you'd never really look at. But apparently this is set six months after the original game when Alex defeated Jankin the Great mm. and he reca- reclaimed the, the crown. Now, this is all about, you know, the kind of what happened after the original well, game. What about the Omega Drive game? There was one that came out there with Mega Drive, yeah. wasn't there? What was that? I can't remember the name of that one now. Enchanted Castle or something. The early like night, yeah. I, 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 this just jumps over that, so that, oh, ne- oh, that yeah, never happened. Oh, ignores happens. that. Yeah, yeah, that, that was just, yeah. Mega Drive never happens. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We, we're still living in 1987. Yeah. yeah. So if you want to play Alex Kidd in Miracle World Part 2, if you've been waiting 30 years to finally find out what happens next, and it's even better that it's free as well. Yeah. So we'll pop that download in our show notes at theretrohour.com. Now, before we get to uh, this week's special guest, Eugene Jarvis, did you ever play FIFA back in the early days, you know, on the Mega Drive or the 3DO? Yeah, I did. I used to. Uh, absolutely love it. Um, obviously, Sensible World of Soccer was far superior. But, um, you were a mega fan. Boy, <laughs> yeah, <you. laughs> but FIFA had some pretty funny moments in it. I, I remember there was this particular thing where the referee couldn't issue you a card unless he caught up with you. <laughs> yeah. So what you could do is just literally do the worst foul and then run into the stands. Yeah. And your mate would be sitting there like, oh, come on, just let the referee catch up with you. You'd be going around for like two hours. So, yeah. Well, actually, you know, that glitch is pretty famous, isn't it? And I think yeah, you could do yeah. that up into like, like FIFA 96 or something, couldn't you? Yeah, 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 yeah. Really you could keep doing it. And it was with both cards as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, this has inspired a mockumentary. Now, this is from a YouTube channel called 30 for Nerdy. And they've done, I mean, it's like a, you know, six part kind of documentary. This is just a bit about this glitch here. Have a listen to this. I heard that guy was in the hospital for weeks. Like, I hit him so hard his kid got a concussion. So it's a clear red card we got on our hands here. Uh, No doubt about it. But when I go to book him, (laughs) this bozo takes off. (laughs) It was fight or flight, I suppose. I mean, it's not like I had a plan or anything. 
I just knew that I was fast. I'm like the fastest guy on the field. And as it long was... as I could stay one step ahead of that Oh, ref, it's one of the funniest glitches. I just forgot about me. that. I'm not in the greatest shape, obviously. Um, my colleagues, they call me Porker, affectionately. Unfortunately, I just had a heavy breakfast that morning. <laughs> uh, eggs, uh, French toast. Uh, that, that's friends. that's fantastic that that kind of that's gone out to everybody and they've all shared that experience because I thought that was just unique with me and my friends. Yeah, well, it's like this has only got six hundred ninety-one views at the moment, which you know it only came out like at the time of recording this two days ago. Yeah, I spotted this on Reddit and this is actually really funny. And obviously, this guy's playing the referee; the other one's meant to be the yeah. player, and they're reflecting on this infamous football incident back in the early nineties. Favorite in that. So uh, <laughs> yeah, you've got to have a look at that. I'll put that in this week's show notes as well. Right then, thank you so much for checking out episode number seventy-five of the Retro Hour podcast. We'll be out again next Friday. Available from all of your favorite podcast clients. I've actually started listening on Stitcher. Oh, yeah. Just saying. Are yeah. you enjoying Stitcher? Well, the reason I did it is before I went away on holiday. I noticed, like... It was I, to write a review. <laughs> well, like, I, was, I looked at my um, iPhone usage, because I want to film quite a lot of videos on holiday yeah, yeah. in Italy, and I only had something like four gigabytes left. I looked at my podcast app, it was taking up about 16 gigs. Oh, jeez. Yeah, so yeah, much. Yeah. So, yeah, I thought, well, I'll clear all those out. I'll try using Stitcher instead because it streams them. So there's there's like, quite a nice one called Overcast as well. Okay, yeah. yeah. yeah that, that's nice name. Good okay. stuff, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you know, we are on pretty much every podcast client, and if there is one that we're not, do let us know, we'll try other things. Yes, on um, we were told that we weren't on a podcast client the other day, and the guy actually put Retro Hours one word, so put a space in there, guys. <laughs> <laughs> the Retro Hour Podcast. Yeah, that does it. <laughs> so listen, we appreciate that, guys. Thank you so much for checking out this week's show. Uh, we'll see you next week, and now... This one is, oh, I've been so looking forward to this since he said we've got this guy on. Oh, yeah, we've got, like, one of the best games designers in the world, pretty much. This is Eugene Jarvis. The Arcade Master on the Retro Hour podcast for the next 50 minutes or so. And we'll see you next week. Ciao. You're listening to the Retro Hour podcast, and it is time to welcome this week's special guest. We are humbled to have him on the show. Welcome to the Retro Hour, Eugene Jarvis. Hey, Eugene. Hey, it's a pleasure to be here, Ravi. You're uh, quite infamous out there for bringing all the dinosaurs back and interviewing them. So I'm, <laughs> I'm here, man. Hopefully I won't... Uh, create too much carnage you know uh. <laughs> well, well actually let's get really prehistoric i want to go all the way back to the beginning what was your uh, what was your first ever experience with a computer then where, where did it all begin ah uh, you know the, this is uh, pretty crazy but uh, i guess i was in high school and uh the actually ibm had uh, i guess their headquarters or one of their headquarters was, was where i grew up in uh, san jose california and uh, they had some kind of programming seminar that I guess we had to write out the program on a piece of uh, paper. I don't think we actually ever even put it in the computer, but it was interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I know. What language was that? Um, I think it was Fortran, as I recall. And uh, eventually got into, uh, when I got into college, I actually uh, did some programming of punch cards. I don't know if you guys even remember that stuff, yeah. but uh, they were uh, you know, kind of holes you know the hanging chad kind of things where you uh, punch holes and cardboard cards and uh, have this deck of cards that you shoveled into the computer and pray that they would read correctly and i remember one time i was running across campus uh, late to my class and i tripped and my 2000 cards went flying and oh. and so my my program was you know took me a while to get it back into order there <laughs> <laughs> so now my, my mother used to work on mainframes in the 70s and she used to tell me about punch cards and uh yeah, it sounded like quite hard work to load programs in off them. It was crazy. I mean, uh, but you know, somehow we got work done, and yeah, you know, I don't know if we work any faster today. We just we just seem to progressively get lazier and lazier. You know. <laughs> <laughs> well, when did you get an interest in gaming? Then when did that begin? This was back in the uh, I guess mid seventies. Uh, uh, they had a an old mainframe in the basement of the physics building at uh, UC Berkeley. Basically, you could load up again. You had to get this deck of, I don't know, 10,000 cards or something, load this thing up, and it, and it played uh, Space War, yeah, wow. which was, in my mind, probably the first real video game. And it only ran on you know mainframes or mini computers. Uh, I guess that was developed in MIT in uh, the early 1960s. And uh, that was a really, really rich game, uh, two-player, player versus player, 
thrust, fire, rotate type controls, uh, you know, just kind of a death match out there. They actually had gravity and there was suns and asteroids and things. It was really amazing uh, vector graphics, so the resolution was incredible, um, even better than games today. So, but it was black and white vectors, and uh, but man, it was just amazing. I, I, that that kind of captivated me. It was one of those games where, you know, you start at midnight, and then before you know it, it's you know 7 a.m. and you're late to class. You know, um, uh-huh. you just kind of lose yourself in the game. I, to me, that's that's the coolest thing about video games is. Is you you get into this alternate reality and, and you just lose yourself. You lose track of time. You lose track of your life. You know, and just enter this fantasy world. So I guess you'd have a lot of access to that machine then. Yeah, well, late at night, you know, it was uh, wasn't a lot of people around, uh, you know, in those days. But uh, so it was, it was cool. You could play it as much as you wanted. You know, I mean, it would crash now and then. You'd have to. You know, kick a few circuit boards or something, and you know, <laughs> you know, powered up and down. And I mean, you know, it wasn't exactly a stress-free experience. Not quite as, uh, not quite uh, as well engineered to say an iPad or something. Around that time, before like the arcade culture really kicked in with video games. I mean, pinball, I guess, was the main thing. I mean, you were quite into that at the time, I take it. Yeah. So I mean, that was my, you know, when I wasn't uh, hanging out at the physics lab. You know, there was a lot of pinball arcades around in those days, and it was the old electromechanical games. They didn't. Uh, this is before the electronic revolution of pinball, and so you know, a lot of the the, the bing, 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 bing. You know, ding, 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 ding. Uh, ka-ching, 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 you know, um, uh, relays and bells and buzzers and uh, you know, I mean, you look at some of those games today, and they see so simplistic and. Uh, you know, like how could you even play that? You know, how you know it's like, like you know, it's like like we're progressively getting more and more ADHD, you know, and stuff that you know was incredibly interesting, you know, 30, 40 years ago. Now is it's good for about ten seconds, but that was that was the cool thing at the time, and uh, it was just it was just cool trying to trying to beat the machine. I mean, that was uh, pinball was all about, you know, just how do you how do you you know and beat it any way you could, you know, tilt it. Uh, try to you know move it around, uh, beat on it, uh, bang on it. You know, try to kick the coin door a few times to get an extra play. You know, whatever you could to beat the machine. You know, <laughs> you, know you mentioned like the sound of the relays and stuff like that. I mean, I love yeah. hearing all that because I mean, it's something like you know so deliciously analog about it, isn't it? It's you know. It's wonderful. Yeah, I, it's awesome, man. Actually, they have that. Uh, there's that one ringtone on, on the iPhone that is an old pinball machine. That's pretty cool. Yeah. And uh, pinball wasn't very uh, socially acceptable at the time, was it? Yeah, you know, it, it was kind of bizarre, you know, because it really was not. I mean, if you thought, think about pastimes that will destroy your life, and uh, pinball was certainly not not up there in the top ten as far as sending you to the emergency room or something. But uh, yeah, it. Uh, I you know, I think it was just this, you know, like wasting your time playing games. You know, I think that was. You know, the society, it was, just, you know, the Protestant work ethic, you know, and like if you're sitting around playing pinball or pool or any other game. I mean, it was it was like, uh, you know, you're wasting your life away, you know, but that I think that's part of what made it cool. You know, is that uh, it wasn't uh, it was kind of corrupt in, in some ways. I, and uh, that was part of the appeal. You know, your parents didn't want you there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's always I struck did. me as like a weird attitude when people say that. Cause it's like, you know, the, the people that say that are normally the ones that spend like 12 hours a day watching TV, aren't they? <laughs> Which is like, <laughs> Exactly. Well, I think, you know, you're always, the fault you hate is the fault you see in yourself, you know. I mean, I think that's that's so true. Um, but, you know, it's, and the weird thing is where pinballs were, like the arcades, often they would uh, double as, you know, maybe stores that would sell you know dirty magazines under the counter or you know other other less socially acceptable activities so <laughs> it was it was kind of maybe it wasn't the pinball it was just what was going around uh, around the pinball you know the other activities taking place the edges of society all in the <laughs> store kind of. yeah yeah kind of the dregs and you know obviously there was a lot of entrepreneurs you know, selling uh, different mind-altering substances in those days and different things like that. <laughs> well, um, you kind of wanted to get into gaming and be employed by it, so you uh, got interviewed by Atari, but you got no callback. Yeah, you know, that um, 
it, it was like, I mean, the, the brochure was really cool. It's like, oh my God, you know, these guys made Pong and they were, you know, they were starting to do some really cool stuff. Uh, like, uh, I guess the, the big game at that time was Breakout. And that was, you know, amazingly well-crafted game. And uh, so, you know, I was super excited to um, try to get involved with Atari. They also were getting into the pinball business. So it was like my dream job. But, you know, I guess I didn't really have a lot of follow-through in those days. You know, I just kind of like went to the interview and expected, you know, like somehow they would call me back. And, you know, after a few months, uh, I kind of gave up and, and took a job at Hewlett Packard. So, <laughs> And how, how did that go? <laughs> You know, I lasted about three days there. So. <laughs> yeah, was it was it just I, not gaming or? Yeah, it was. You know, it, it was it was uh, a project. Actually, it was it was a six year project to, which is pretty funny. I mean, it's crazy to, to think of like up front they said it was six years. You know, you know how software projects projects go. You know, it's always you say it's six months, it turns out to be a year or two, and you say it's two years, it's four years. They were saying it was six years, so this might have been a, they should, they could still be working on this project. I, mean, I don't know, but uh, it was to do a COBOL compiler, which is COBOL is kind of like, I don't know, a government uh, programming, government programming language, you know, and uh, somehow talk, you know, the, the guy who interviewed me was super dynamic, so I, I got excited about this whole thing, but the reality of, of working on this COBOL compiler and and uh, hanging out with my fellow engineers who, for lunchtime, you know, they like to talk about their lawn sprinkler systems and stuff. I mean, this was kind of the early days of home automation. People were really excited by, you know, hooking up their lawn sprinklers to their, you know, Apple II or whatever. <laughs> was HP a bit of a, like a Dilbert kind of zone then, was it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was. It, it definitely was, you know. And uh, I, remember, I remember I showed up to work and I go, hey, what do you want me to do? You know, I'm ready to work, you know, like. Oh, you know, why don't you just learn how to like log on to the computer today? You know. <laughs> <laughs> well, eventually, of course, uh, Atari did call you back. Um, yes. How, how did you start working for them, and what were you initially doing there then? Okay. Well, they. Um, I guess they were starting this pinball division, and 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 at this basically in this at this time, this is 1977. The um, pinball there was this revolution starting where they were getting rid of the all the relays and the clackers and the score reels and stuff and and turning these uh pinball machines into an electronic game with electronic sounds and light effects you know i mean originally it was just maybe at this level it was just kind of electromechanical emulation but obviously there was a lot of possibilities that, that you could see coming in the future with the total you know microprocessor electronification of of pinball so my job was to become the programmer of their first game called the Atarians. And there was a guy who had kind of started up the program and, and started up the whole process. And he was like moving on to some super secret project. So I was kind of the, the guy to, that had to come on and make it actually work, you know? <laughs> and so I came on to finish the programming of the Atarians. And, uh, but it was kind of a chaotic scene in those days of Atarian. And I, I think after about a week, I think my boss quit. Then after another couple of weeks, his boss quit. And so within like a week or two, I was the head of the uh, programming department for pinball, <laughs> just just uh, for showing up, you know? <laughs> you, you don't often hear about Atari pinball as well. It's kind of a, a little unknown kind of um, area. Quite I forgotten. Think. Yeah. Yeah, it was kind of a disaster. I mean, uh, you know, not because of me, but, uh, <laughs> um, you know, there, there's a lot of issues. Uh, you know, Atari was kind of a freewheeling, you know, mellow lifestyle and stuff. And, and, and uh, you know, kind of all about flash and concept and kind of the future. And, and you know, a lot of, th you know, pinball actually is a very mechanical kind of beast and, you know, if you don't design things properly, solenoids start burning up and, you know, things break. And um, so Atari, the Atari pinball, they wanted, they kind of redid everything. They, they decided to put in magnetic sensors instead of switches, you know, get rid of all these, these switches that are breaking, put in magnetic sensors for the ball, um, get rid of the score reels, have this cool um, uh, gas discharge displays, um, and a lot of interesting things. Uh, but I guess one problem was they put the uh, controlling board right in the bottom of the pinball cabinet, and 
unfortunately, pinball machines being uh, the mechanical beast they are, every now and then, like, pieces of metal and wire and stuff will kind of conductive material, you know, mm. metal fragments, wires and crap come falling down, and they were falling down on the PC board, which was not... <laughs> <laughs> Not a good idea. So there was, you know, that, th those things would short out, and then more things would start burning up, and <laughs> you almost got this kind of uh, negative feedback loop where, you know, the more things, the more things that fell into the play field, you know, it would start burning up more things and triggering more horrible events, and uh, <laughs> a few, a few of them actually just caught on fire. So, oh, wow. Um, it was, uh, it, there's just, uh, it was trying to re-engineer everything and. Unfortunately, a lot of the, there was, wasn't a lot of testing, and uh, the, you know the magnet switches were a great idea. But I guess people figured out how to shoot. To they would just get powerful magnets, and above the play field, they'd like put it in a cigarette pack or something, and then just run up the score by moving their magnet-containing cigarette pack <laughs> around the play field. Hack, hack in the pinball <laughs> machine. So yeah, no, it was yeah, it was, and that that was obviously a time-honored tradition of hacking these things. But it's ama it's amazing the the uh, intelligence of, of pinball players, you know, to the ingenuity. I mean, actually, there's another thing they would do is uh, they could re they'd remove the bolts that held the leg on, and then you'd put a wire. You'd feed a wire through there, and, and you could, if you bent it the right way, you could actually trigger the the coin switch by <laughs> by sticking a little wire through the where the leg bolt was. And uh, and uh, you know, the, it's interesting. Like the the games that were made in Chicago, which was the traditional pinball place, those all those games had these metal plates that would prevent you from doing that. But you know, the engineers of the Atari says, well, what is this metal plate for? Get rid of that. You know, that's like three bucks, man. <laughs> like that's stupid. You know, it's like so. There was a lot of like stupid things that had been engineered in these games over the years that uh, Atari got rid of, and uh, I think unfortunately to uh, to our chagrin, our, our games were not there reliable. Well, what was um, the culture like at Atari then? Because that must have been quite an exciting place to be in the late seventies. Yeah, it, well, you know what the weirdest thing was? It was like the, again, the the programming was kind of primitive. Um, it was kind of, it's kind of almost like I almost like harken back to these times. Uh, we would actually, again, actually, we would write. Uh, this is before many computers. I guess the microprocessors were just starting, but we had like kind of this mini computer editing system, and we'd you'd actually write the program out on a piece of paper, and you would hand it to the the key punch girl, and then she would type your the program into the uh, computer, and it was kind of like you know like min. There's something about men, like typing was not, you know, somehow men couldn't type, you know. <laughs> so you had to have women do the typing for you, which, I mean, it was not too efficient, but it gave us a lot of time to play games, you know. <laughs> so, you know, you'd submit your program to the uh, key punch department, and then you would go off and play pinball for a couple hours, and then, you know, come back like, is my program ready? <laughs> it's like you kind of a genteel lifestyle of the uh, pampered programmer of the 70s, you know. You end up joining Williams, and uh, you must have been excited getting that job. Yeah, so um, actually, I worked at Atari with uh, a great designer who's who um, his name is Steve Ritchie, and he got a little frustrated working at Atari after a while just because of the the issues, uh, some of the um, reliability issues we had, and so um, he got a job at Chicago and Chicago at Williams and. Uh, so I kind of, you know, and I, it was funny. He said, "Hey, come out to Chicago, man, and uh, let's do pinball together." So I, I went out interviewing in, in March of, of uh, I think it was '78, and I got in Chicago, and it was just like this gray, dirty, greasy place that was just freezing, you know. And I'm coming from California, and I'm going, you know what? I will never ever come here again <laughs> in my life. You know, it's like this place is miserable. And uh, a year later, I I went to Williams. <laughs> Part of the problem was Steve couldn't get along with his programmers. He's kind of rough on them, and uh, you know, actually made them do things. <laughs> you know, uh, it, it's like it's so it's it's funny. Like um, in, in those days, like as a programmer, it was it was very much a Dilbert kind of thing, where you know people would ask you like, "Hey, can you do this?" You know, and if you thought it was a stupid idea or didn't like it, you just go, "Oh, that's impossible." You know, we can't do that. And and it was funny, like the, the programmer that was uh, that I replaced on the Atariids. I guess somebody had asked him, you know, um, hey man, uh, can you like flash a light on the on the game, you know, flash a light on the playfield? 
And the guy, dude, dude, the guy, I guess, said, hey, that's that's impossible, man. You just can't do it. And so everybody, like, management goes, okay, I guess you can't do it. <laughs> it's like, so then I got hired, and then they asked me, and they go, hey, could you, like, flash a light? And I'm like, yeah, sure, man. I'll, you know, give me five minutes, you know. <laughs> now it's possible. <laughs> and, so, and so I was like a hero. I was like this incredible hero, you know. And they, they, uh, actually, they, they, my nickname became Dr. J because I was such a programming genius. I could flash lights. But it was... <laughs> But I think it's still true today. You know, if programmers don't like the idea, they'll just say, you know, oh, that, that, that'll take three years or, you know, that's too complicated. You know, that'll, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, it's like it's a great kind of power trip that uh, programmers have over the world because people don't really understand what they do um, as well as they should. It's kind of having that knowledge is like, you know, the key to it. And you kind of exactly. abuse, abuse the power. <laughs> abuse, yeah. Power, absolute power uh, corrupts. Absolutely, right? <laughs> well, it must have been a massive change in the kind of, you know, energy surrounding arcade games when Space Invaders came out. Yeah, that was, uh, that was just incredible because, uh, I mean, before then, most of the, the video games were kind of of the Ponger variety and you know, Breakout was kind of an exception. That was kind of a, kind of on the road to Space Invaders. It was kind of interesting. You think about Breakout and the the blocks would scroll down, and it's interesting how Space Invaders is kind of like the instead of having blocks scrolling down on you, you had you know little Space Invaders coming down and animating and stuff. So it's 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 so interesting to see how like one game evolves into the next game. You know, as you go through the history of video games. But Space Invaders, I mean, the cool thing about that, it was just kind of the ultimate man versus machine, you know, single player showdown. And it was it was just a, a full like audio visual experience because um, a key thing of it not only had great animations and sounds and incredible challenge and, and the gameplay, but it had kind of this accelerating pace, like the the deeper you got into the game and the more invaders you killed, the faster and the faster and more aggressive they became and you know, just like, and they had kind of this, this like, you know, as the invaders marching down the screen, you know, you're dead. And and your heart was doing that at the same time of playing it. Exactly, exactly. It would, it would, it would be like this. You'd have this kind of this sympathetic heart, cardiac arrest. You know, and and I I do think there were a few players that that expired playing the game and. It was it, you really you just got so emotional and so crazed by it and and you know I mean early on when before you know people were any good I mean you, you'd be dead in you know twenty or thirty seconds and but you just had to keep coming back coming back I mean people would line up. I, I remember like arcades would have five or ten of these games you know and people would just line up three or four deep waiting for the, the guy the next guy to die you know and and have your twenty second go at it. And uh, it was just incredibly addictive. I guess in Japan, it was insane. I think they had over a quarter million uh, Space Invader games operating at its peak in, in Japan. And it was, anyway, amazing. Uh, it was an amazing thing. And it just, it kind of showed where video games could go, where they, they could be truly, you know, cinematic experiences with all the emotion of, you know, a, an action movie or, you know, just incredible uh, experience. If you look at those early Space Invaders cabinets, and I mean, you know, they didn't have color. They had the, you know, the different color plastic they put on the screen, wouldn't they? Yeah, well, that was super clever, man. Yeah. You know, so, I mean, it was like, it's amazing how, you know, like, necessity is the mother of invention. It was like, ah, oh, you know, this black and white's really boring. Like, ah, oh, the color TVs are really expensive. Like, hey, let's just get some, uh, like, plastic wrap and, you know color it you know with a felt pen you know, we have red and green yellow you know i mean it was it was amazing it was like you know it, it cost i don't know 30 cents or something to have a color tv essentially amazing hack you know that uh that you know turned turned a boring black and white game into color how did you come up with the idea of defender then so um i kind of got bit, bit by this whole video game thing and and uh, you know and the, and the coolest thing about you know video games was you know when you're doing a pinball machine you always have like this pinball designer this mechanical designer dude that's always kind of getting all the glory and kind of you're kind of the wrist you know like implementing you're, you're not you're not a glorified designer you're a, you're an implementer and as a program i think programmers are all megalomaniacs you know they they really deep in their heart they wanted to like just take over the world and 
get everything for themselves and, you know, hack all bank accounts, ransom all um, personal data, you know, um, so do, you know, do something important, you know? <laughs> and so becoming a video game designer was like, okay, now you're the boss. Now, you know, you're the, you're the big cheese. And if somebody asks you to do something, you know, you can tell them it's impossible. And, you know, you're the man. It's funny though, I, I guess the, 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 probably the coolest thing I ever saw, you know, you always get all these suggestions when you're developing a game. And there's always way more suggestions than you have time to implement them. And uh, this guy I, I worked with years later at Williams, Ed Boone, who was the co-creator of Mortal Kombat. And, and actually that game is still going today, very strong. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the thing he would do is whenever you ask him, like, hey, man, can you like do a fatality, fatality scene, you know, where the, you know, the guy's head goes into a blender or something, you know, and, and he'd go, oh, that's a great idea. And he would just hand you his keyboard, you know? <laughs> and it was like, at that point, you know, you know, people would always go, well, you know, I, I didn't mean me programming it. I, mean, I meant you doing this. Um, anyway, try, the, the being a video game guy, uh, designer was like the ultimate uh, thing where you controlled your own world. You could create your own universe. And so... Uh, I jumped at the chance of of doing a an original game and uh, um, and uh, I, I love the title Defender because um, I felt like if you're going to create a lot of mayhem and carnage, you need a moral justification, you know. And so if you're defending something, then you can pretty much, you know, be Clint Eastwood and Sylvester Stallone and whoever else is out there. Um, you know, you can pretty much do anything you want, kick total ass, and it's still okay. So that was kind of the the idea of Defender was just, you know, kicking the universe's butt in a moral fashion. Well, you know, technically it was quite a marvel. I mean, you know, you had Asteroids before it, which was, you know, quite pacey, but it was all on a single screen. I mean, Defender, you know, it was really like a quite a fast paced game, wasn't it, for the time and technically quite a marvel. (laughs) Yeah, you know what? I mean, we kind of started with a blank slate. You know, it's interesting if you're starting from nothing, sometimes there's no limit to how good or terrible you can be. And uh, so the idea, you know, and, and, you know, there was a lot of competition as there are today. There was millions of clones of space invaders and asteroids and stuff. And and so it was a challenge. Like, what do you do? What can you do differently? You know, and, and, uh, um, and it was kind of, I, we, we got, we got into um, trying to get some feeling of like flight, you know, feeling of speed and really hard to do that on like a single screen. And so there had, you know, at this time, actually a big innovation was scrolling of text on text editors and stuff. They were just starting to do that on some of the higher end systems. And so this business of kind of like scrolling the screen was something that was out there and it was like, Hey, well, why don't we scroll the screen, you know, in a horizontal direction to get kind of this feeling of flight. So creating a screen, and it turns out the Defender universe, I think, is about three and a half screens. Seems like a lot more, but the cool thing is is by wrapping it around um, where, you know, you get to the end of the screen and you just kind of wrap, the universe wraps around into kind of a, a cylinder, essentially. And, uh, you know, that wraparound thing was something that was used in asteroids and uh, space war um, in earlier times. So... It was kind of it's, it's kind of allows you to get have a screen that seems much more spacious, and uh, so you know, kind of it gives you it gives you a ability to kind of have a real universe out there, and um, and so then you know, with the bigger screen, you needed a um, kind of a radar screen to show you where the guys were off screen and stuff. So that was kind of cool too. So you could see the whole world, and you could see you know the the immediate world around you and. Uh, Defender, you know, I, I, we we developed uh, a number of really bad games and and just kept kept you know kind of iteratively programming it and making things better. At one point, it had like Space Invader type guys in it, and one point it had a lot of asteroids in it. And uh, but it, we just kept evolving the game and adding. Uh, uh, I remember we kind of threw everything out and just started programming the little um, humanoids, hmm. astronauts. And I, and uh, creating a terrain, that little line of terrain, which was kind of all we could do with the uh, graphics throughput we had. And 
the management was kind of shocked because I had thrown out the entire game and just had little men walking around on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> This was after about six months of the project, and I think we only had three months left uh, to have a game for their big uh, coin op show. And uh, so I remember they they were, I think, pretty seriously considering firing me at that point. Wow. <laughs> it was just these little men walking around the screen, and I had this little. I spent like a week or two having they actually animate, you know, which normally you don't really notice this, but it meant a lot to me. <laughs> That's, so these little guys are walking around the planet, and they're like, you know, but dude, where's the game, man? It's like, <laughs> they're like two pixels high. <laughs> exactly. Where's the game, dude? It was like, wow, you know, that's, you got these, do you get it? You're defending these guys, you know. So that was kind of the, the, I think I got on the right path there. And so defending guys, and uh, and then it was like, okay, well, now there needs to be some evil. You had to have a bad guy, you know, and so then... The uh, the bad guys, the the mutants, I guess the landers, which attack your humanoids and creating the mutants, and and uh, so it kind of kind of created this whole story sort of taking place, and uh, and, and and you know I think it, that was really cool, um, but I think one thing that really made Defender was the um, special effects. I had this co-programmer on the game, his name's Sam Dicker, and a brilliant kid and. Uh, I remember uh, at some point in the project, maybe six months in, maybe it was around the humanoids. Um, I was like, man, I need to get another some another another coder on this project. You know, if we're going to finish this thing in three months, and we started interviewing people, and this guy Sam comes in, and um, I think he just like had graduated high school, maybe dropped out of college. You know, I was like, I'm like, hey, dude, uh, do you know how to program? And he goes, yeah, yeah, I could do that. I'm like, okay, you're hired. It was like. <laughs> That was like that was the interview, man. <laughs> You'll do. <laughs> but but, it, but it's amazing, like these dropout guys, you know, like Steve Jobs, you know, Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg. I mean, these dropout guys turn out to be pretty good. <laughs> well, so, you, you know, when you first demoed the the game, I mean, it was at the um, 1980 Amoa show. I mean, what what was, yeah, it, what was your reaction yeah. like from uh, passersby there? Um, you know, it, it, we had uh, it just totally freaked people out because. I don't know, maybe we'd been playing it too long and, and you know, as you, you perfect a game and play it more and more, you make it harder and harder and harder and harder. Partly people just couldn't deal with this whole scrolling universe and we had the thrust fire control from asteroids and we had the hyperspace control which came off the space war and we had um, the left hand was kind of you've kind of played space invaders type control up down digital up down control with the left hand. And so uh and there's like this reverse button in there, and like people just couldn't deal with it, you know. And and uh, the average play time was about 20 seconds, and you know, so nobody really knew. We had no idea if it would ever sell at all. I mean, it was just uh, it was really a vicious little game. And there was so much going on on the screen as well. Like to to kind of see that the first time must have been yeah really yeah like, it, overwhelming yeah. I guess. Yeah, it was, and you had this whole world and like bad things would happen out in the world. Like, you know, you'd be just, a lot of players, they didn't know like how to thrust or do anything. They just kind of sit there on the screen going up and down a little bit. And then while they're doing that, like the landers are all, you know, killing all their humanoids, turning into mutants. And then all these bad guys all of a sudden come back to get you. <laughs> and that's like, and so you're just kind of sitting there and like, Oh, shit. <laughs> and, uh, they would just kind of crawl up the screen and just engorge you, you know? And, uh, so it was uh, it was really tough, you know. Just the, the the players didn't really have the context. It was uh, really a very complicated game with with seven buttons, and uh, so it was it was it was strange. This whole universe, and uh, maybe it was a little too much for uh, certainly for the uh, the business suits at the show. That's for sure. Well, you later on followed with a sequel, Stargate, and. Then you also did Robotron as well, which was one of my favorite games because it, it's just like absolutely insane, that game. <laughs> yeah, and that was kind of like um, trying to do something completely different, you know, and and, uh, and I was just, I'd always loved the game Berserk, which was, a, you know, one of those, a robot killing game. And, and uh, but it was very frustrating to me. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a good player, but not a great player. And, uh, I just felt I was like underpowered. I didn't have enough control, um, especially having 
to kind of move in the direction you're firing because there's only one joystick on the game and, uh, and, and this firing button. And somehow I got the inspiration that having a separate joystick can control firing in motion so you could be truly uh, independent, which is, you know, like in, a re- in real life. I mean, you, you can run away from someone and shoot at them. And so you could have independent firing and, and motion. And uh, that really proved uh, it's amazing how powerful that was. Although it's amazing how a lot of people can't really, um, a fair amount of the population cannot comprehend doing two things at once. You know, it's like walking and chewing gum. Mm. So there was a, uh, an interesting, again, kind of a subset of people that could truly uh, master the Robotron control. And, and uh, the other problem was, of course, is you create this great control for a game giving the player lots of power and there was a really vicious uh, you know laser that you had and and uh, then you have to create the enemies even even worse you know and and uh, I really wanted to have like kind of an ultimate challenge um, where like in space invaders the enemies come down from the top and you know and engulf you but I thought it'd be even more interesting if they came from all sides at once so basically rather than coming down from the top they came from left right up down diagonally it was like completely surrounding you and just like i mean talk about getting uh your focus you know getting getting players attention you know and engaging them it's like okay here you are 100 things surrounding you you know and they're going to kill you like ready set go you, know, that's <laughs> you, like, you can't even blink <laughs> yeah and it just like it just talk about focusing the mind you know and it was just like it, it's weird how you, you start sweating even without exerting yourself, just the tension makes you sweat. And uh, so it was, it was It was just like, let's create like this ultimate challenge of uh, ma- enemy masses from all directions at once. And, and it's amazing. The uh, It's interesting. It's fun just in that one element of a very simple enemy, um, the grunt, you know, get 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 of them and just boom, have them. And they, all they do is just seek you and try to kill you. And uh, but it's it's incredible. You get kind of this incredible rich gameplay from that very simple thing. And uh, uh, I remember it, it was probably the only game I ever did that after three days it, it was fun. Um, just having that firing and and having the uh, everybody surrounding you and just coming at you. And and so it was it was it was a it was a fun project in the aspect of it that you knew it was a good game. Where you know, like Defender was like I mean I struggled months and months and. Um, just trying to get anything that was playable at all, and I mean, I mean, that's that's the tough thing about video game uh, design and video game development is that you start with this blank screen, you know, and like there's there's no limit how you know there's there's really no no bottom limit to how horrible your game can be, and so you have to kind of create this universe out of nothing, you know, and uh, and uh, you know it's it better be cool. Yeah, it was it was it was a really kind of weird game because you'd. You'd spend the time looking for gaps, but also trying to kill the other guys. And then when you'd have this little break between the levels, you'd have this insane kind of a seizure giving um, <laughs> like changeover. <laughs> exactly. That was a kind of clear. It was kind of like a, a visual, you know, mental wipe, just wiping your brain. But, you know, it's, uh, it's interesting. The dynamic that um, we kind of took a dynamic, we added the little humans, the last human family, um, and and the cool thing about that dynamic was, um, it had like this progressive scoring opportunity where each each uh, person you saved you got increasingly more points. So it, you had this incredible like greed, you know, dynamic where you were in really incredibly motivated to get the humans, but then also often you just you'd get killed going after them, you know, and. And so um, it was really, again, like not only you're, you're trying to avoid death and shoot things, but now you have this, like this, you know, gold nuggets out there in the form of humans that you're also trying to gather. So kind of just overload the uh, sensory overload of your brain of, of all these conflicting strategies. You know, should I run away? Should I kill something? Should I go for the human? You have to evaluate all these goals instantaneously to decide what is the course of action and and you kind of have to you know kind of gestalt the entire play field and all the configuration of everybody to see where's where's the route to survival you know where's where's the gap you know and so it's, it's really amazing it, it, the, the mental processing that takes place during a robotron game is 
I think it's got to be amazing. I would love to, I'd love to see like a brainwave monitor, mm. you know, of people, you know, um, as they play. I mean, that could be really interesting. Well, your games, you know, obviously did get more brutal as you went on with like, you know, robots trying to destroy humanity. <laughs> and did you ever kind of want to worry about censorship? I know like stuff like death rates got a lot of attention back then. Yeah, I mean, I, I, the thing is, that was always the the key to success. You know, was was get your game censored. You know, so, yeah. so that was uh, obviously in the in the modern generation. You know, you had Grand Theft Auto, and what was that the hot coffee mod or something? Yeah, or whatever it was. Um, but always, it always. Uh, I mean, I remember. Uh, yeah, there was always. You know, it always seemed to be a uh, breaking the limits. Always enabled. You know, all these outraged. Older people, you know, outraged, and they banned the game, and then that would just, you know, that was the best marketing you could get. <laughs> well, games like uh, kind of uh, Total Carnage, I remember, and uh, Smash TV as well, they, they were very brutal as well. And I kind of love the concept behind Smash TV, you know, a TV show where you kind of, the aim is to survive, and you've yeah, just got waves it, it, of people it, it, coming in. That was a great concept. Yeah, I mean, it was, uh, you know, killing people for toasters. I mean, it was good video. It was, I mean, uh, you know, I, I still think, uh, I don't know, we're not there yet. I mean, it, it, maybe we will get to that point. I, I hope not. But uh, it's weird how, how it had such a uh, kind of a black sense of humor, you know, where you're, you know, you're, you're getting, you know, you're winning all these wonderful prizes and, uh, you know, then, then, you know, you make a wrong move and you're just like bludgeoned to death, you know. And, you know, and you you give up your toasters uh, <laughs> to somebody else. It really kind uh, of reminds me of, like, Running Man or, you know, that kind of 90s exactly. uh, crazy game show style. Exactly. And we have kind of the MC guy there. And we, we, t- we threw a little kind of RoboCop humor in there. And uh, um, I guess my favorite animation, though, in that game, uh, if you, as a player, if you step on a landmine, you know, you get all these pieces, you know, arms, legs, you know, different pieces of you kind of fly. And then there's this kind of 3D fact where your eyeball comes all the way up and like it's almost, <laughs> you know, becomes like, you know, huge part of the screen is your eyeball just detached from its socket, <laughs> bloody, you know, kind of coming right at you. You know, it's like, oh, my God. And it just, it's, you know, it's, 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 like, it's almost humorous, you know, it's like it's uh, – just over the top, and uh, uh, you know, there's some inter- the fun thing where you're you're fighting the enemy mutoid man and the boss monster, and uh, you know, at some point you blow off different layers of them, and he, you know, he ends up in his like polka dot underwear or something. You know, it turns out the incredibly macho boss monster is actually a you know cross dresser. You know. <laughs> Well, you know, just when you thought things, I couldn't get any more shocking than that. I do remember uh, Narc was like one of the most, you know, ultra-violent video games when I was a kid. You know, my mum would be like, well, you're not playing that one at the arcades. But that, yeah, you know, the digitized yeah, that characters, I think, crazy. made it, didn't they? Yeah, we, you know, we really got into it with that game. Um, I remember at that time, the, the market was really dominated by a lot of Japanese um, hand-drawn animation. And, and I mean, the, the artwork was, you know, just amazing um, in the, in the that was in the you know mid to late eighties uh, style, just great great um, you know anime and great um, animation and uh, and like you know you, you look at that you'd, and you'd almost just cry like how are we ever going to do anything you know a tenth as good as that and and so we kind of decided hey let's let's do digitizing you know let's digitize real stuff you know and I mean because like why does video games really have to be all about animation and stuff? You look at movies and, you know, 90% of the movies are live action, you know? And uh, so it's like, hey, let's do real live action video video games where we, you know, have real actors and actresses and, you know, f- film anime, you know, film stuff and, you know, film actors on green screens and, you know, get all their, uh, digitize them, you know, get all the uh, animation loops and then, you know, throw it into create you know backgrounds and um a lot of times we'd go out and digitize uh like for narc we digitize kind of you know tough urban areas and uh um and so we you know put these green screen characters you know video animations on t- on you know put them in these urban environments and amazingly uh amazing realism and uh and uh especially when you like blew someone up with a rocket launcher and they're <laughs> they're they kind of burst into flames and ah, I mean it was uh, 
um, you know, uh, some, there was just a joy to that. I mean, and it wasn't, I know, it, it wasn't really like nothing cruel or anything. It just, it was, it was pretty crazy. Any um, influence for Mortal Kombat from there? If uh, Ed Boon was hanging around. Oh, yeah. You know, well, Ed, of course, was hanging around. And I think, you know, obviously he uh, actually did a little help for us on uh, uh, some of those projects. And uh, he, re- Ed, I think really, uh, him, um, John Tobias was his um, art guy. And uh, he truly, you know, kind of stepped it up a notch. And uh, with the one on one combat, with that kind of realistic feel, it really had, you know, the violence had much more of an impact, especially when you, you know, would separate someone from their spinal cord you know <laughs> it's funny that 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 actually was uh i mean i guess narc was somewhat controversial uh, uh but uh mortal Kombat, i think really got the attention of the world there and uh um, i think i think actually mortal Kombat was the reason there are video game ratings today yeah well um recently and- I went into an arcade in uh, England and I, I saw this machine and it was a giant Space Invaders frenzy machine. And I thought, oh, ah! I thought this, <laughs> this looks great. And I saw on the back that it was Raw Thrills. So that's actually your company, isn't it? Yeah. So that we, we uh, you know, we, we, we got into um, this kind of retro thing where um, uh, we kind of got, you know, like, you know, like, hey, how do we take kind of these old games and and create like this incredible excitement and stuff and and it was like hey let's you know the the we, we were researching different display stuff and we realized hey man we can put together you know it's like these billboards or stadium signs you have these led um modules and you can basically recreate these old games with one led per pixel and so it's like the the exact resolution as the original game you know, except in like a 10 foot screen and every pixel is an LED and it, and you have this brightness that just like this brightness kind of burning into your brain with the, the, you know, the pixels, it's kind of like the ultimate retro display of, of a video game. And, uh, we did a Pac-Man game like that and, you know, people went crazy. And so we, uh, we decided to do, uh, Space Invaders. It's and, really uh, intense. You know, when you're in front of that LED screen and there's kind of explosions and it's just yeah. like 10 foot of retroness, <laughs> you're right. It's, it's, I've never seen anything like it, really. Yeah. And we kind of put it on steroids. You know, it's, uh, it, it was kind of weird. You know, actually we had um, original, I mean, actually the original project, and this was two or three years ago, when we thought about this retro thing, we were really thinking of Space Invaders because I had such an obsession with Space Invaders and, and so it's like, hey, let's. We got the license for Space Invaders. We're going to do all this stuff, and then uh, um, so we had the team working on Space Invaders, and then uh, all of a sudden, uh, my partner Andy says, "Hey, man, we got the uh, Pac-Man license." And so then, like the Space Invaders team goes, "Oh man, we're screwed, man. It's like screw Space Invaders. Let's do Pac-Man." <laughs> <laughs> so, so we like abandon the Space Invaders project. For you know a year or two while we did Pac-Man, and then and then it was like um, after we did Pac-Man and you know people loved it and and then it was like uh, this payment is coming due on this Space Invaders license, man. It's like we're gonna we're paying so much money for this, we've got to do the game. So it was like uh, trying to figure like like what do we do for the game? I mean, Space Invaders is an incredible game, but you know like 30 years later, you know and again we were talking about all this ADHD people. You know, how do we get something more dynamic? And um, you know, we kind of have the laser base out there. And the problem is, if you're just strictly retro, you know, we all have these warm memories of retro games, but retro games are, you know, kind of old and sometimes sort of old-fashioned. And uh, and to really get excited, you have to you have to kind of take the retro game but make something cooler. And uh, and so we kind of got the the uh, crazy idea to instead of just having a shooting at your little laser base guy is like, hey, let's put a couple of machine guns on this thing. And we had our kind of machine gun controllers from our game Jurassic Park. And so we just bolted those onto the Space Invaders. And all of a sudden now, you know, it's like, now, you know, it's it's more of a fair fight. You know, it's like <laughs> you got a thousand Space Invaders and like, okay, you need a machine gun. You know, it's like you can't just pick them off one at a time. All of a sudden now you're mowing them down with a machine gun. And, and it was just like, 
it was just amazing good fun you know just like it's like oh this is cool but then of course the machine game gave you too much of an advantage so then we we had to start multiple arrays of space invaders coming down on you so it's like so it became just like incredible just complete chaos uh we also threw in some power-ups uh you know reminiscent of uh like missile command and you know threw in some other uh nice uh extras and uh it, so really it became like this mega chaos where it's like space invaders squared and uh and and people just can't they, they just can't stop playing it even though you still die in like 30 seconds but <laughs> it's fine <laughs> well it's fantastic to go in the arcades and see this kind of old yeah. retro machine yeah. and we're really yeah. glad that you're still doing it eugene <laughs> getting the arcades out there yeah i love yeah no it's it's uh I don't know. There's just something cool about that arcade experience where it's just it's very immediate. It's there, and you know you just step up to a game and do it. It's just you know it's just that challenge. You know, man versus machine, man. You one of these days I'm gonna I'm gonna win. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, what projects have you got coming up then? What what's next? Well, actually, we're we're working on um, uh, a couple of interesting things. We uh, we're working actually on. Uh, a game with uh, with my good friend Ed Boone from uh, uh, Mortal Kombat fame, and he's he's been working at Time Warner for a number of years at Warner Brothers actually, and uh, and they have this game called Injustice, which is uh, you know with the superheroes, um, kind of a Mortal Kombat with superhero game, and you know kind of this a little bit dark but very fun a very fun fighting game, and uh, so we are working to bring that game into the arcade on the big screen and uh so that's it and we're going to uh, actually have superhero cards that it's going to dispense so you can collect your superhero cards and get different power-ups and so forth uh um, so we're really really excited about that game it's been uh, a number of years since there's been a really cool fighting game in the arcades and we want to bring it back well eugene it's been amazing talking to you we'll keep an eye out for that yeah, definitely. Hey, thanks, man. It's it's uh, such a, such a joy to to be on the podcast. It's just uh, I don't know. It just it's just fun being a part of the game th- scene, you know. And and thanks for having me on. Yeah, we really enjoyed it. Thanks so much. Cheers. And uh, okay, we'll keep killing people on Smash TV and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> keep it brutal. Yeah. <laughs> right. Until you get your coast. Until you get your toaster, man. You got to kill. <laughs> <laughs> All the best, Eugene. Thank you very much. Cheers. You're welcome. 